Hello and welcome. This is Matthias 76. Together we are decoding the deception. And today we are here in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. And I've got a picture up on the screen that is the what I'm going to use as the thumbnail for this video. And what this is, is a picture that would have been common to everyone that Jesus is speaking to. This is a picture of a sheep pen. Now, the, the, the picture has the shepherd in the door there. And some people think that's the way it worked, that the shepherd slept there in the door, and that way any predators would have to go over him. They had It's not. They had a door that they would close. And, and the shepherd would, there was someone who guarded that pen. And often this was a communal thing. So multiple shepherds would bring their flocks and put them all together within this stone enclosure in order to keep them safe. And there was someone who watched the gate, the door there. And, and we'll talk more about that as we go into the text and see what all Jesus has to say about that. But important point, Jesus is the master teacher. Jesus is profound in his simplicity. He took things that everyone saw on a regular basis. He took things that they understood and used those to teach. Now, he is also, in, in this particular instance, he is also going to pull in something from the Old Testament that was very familiar to everyone who was in the audience. And, and let's talk about the audience. I've mentioned this before. And this is not a knock on any translation. They all do it except for the old King James. They'll just have, with the old King James, at the beginning of the chapter, they would have many little blurbs in small print. The editors would put that in to talk about what's in that chapter. They didn't do the headings thing. And I'm not, oh, there my picture came back. I am not saying, <laughs> my picture keeps coming back. It really wants me. I'll just close it. Now it can't come back. I'm not knocking anything. I'm just pointing out a real issue that these headings bring up. And, and this heading's completely legitimate. Tells you what's coming. I am the good shepherd. Here's the problem. We've got a chapter break, and we've got this heading. In our minds, as modern people of this modern day, and I think most of my audiences in the Western world, we see this and our brain goes, new section, moving on, next thing. It's a new chapter. Number one, John didn't divide the book into chapters. That was done centuries, a millennia later. Okay, He did not do that. And I'm not saying that adding chapters and verse numbers is a bad thing. It's certainly not. It's how I find my way around. It's how you find your way around. But we see a chapter break, and we think it's something different altogether, and it is not. What we have here is a continuation of the discussion that was going on before. Jesus just takes it in a new direction, and that is, in this instance, of vital importance because it gives us understanding into what Jesus is saying here. Because if you want to properly interpret something, do in, in fancy theological terms, we call it exegesis, which literally means lead out, lead out the meaning, draw it out, pull it out, understand it. The first thing you have to know is the audience. If you don't know, for example, that in Matthew 5, Jesus is talking to his disciples. It says that in the immediate verse before. They all sat down on the hill and Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's teaching believers. If you don't understand that, you'll miss a lot of what the Sermon on the Mount is teaching. It's teaching believers about how to walk in 
the righteousness that Christ gives them. Here, he's talking to the Jews who had been arguing with him, first of all, going all the way back to the chapter 5, and we're at chapter 9, chapter 10. They had been arguing with him about his identity, who he was, who he claimed to be. That's important because he's getting ready to, to paint a really vivid picture, a really vivid picture of exactly who he is. And he's going to do that. He's going to do that by drawing on something of which we, and I'm, I'm just talking in generalities here. You might, as an individual, say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I'm offended. And, and if it is, then then God bless you. I'm glad that it doesn't apply to you. But we modern Christians in Western Christendom are, for the most part, woefully ignorant of the Old Testament. We just think it's the stuff that we have to go through so that we can get to the good stuff in the New Testament. And for the most part, we want to know about Genesis a little bit and skip over all the rest and, and get to the meat and bones in the gospel. That's where the, that's where the good stuff, the important stuff is. Well, I can tell you that Jesus certainly didn't look at it that way because he drew on the Old Testament all the time. The whole thing pointed ahead to his coming. That's what it was all about, progressive revelation over that period of time. But in this instance, in this instance, Jesus is going to make a very practical application and proclaim himself to be the the fulfillment of something that's talked about in the book of Ezekiel. That Ezekiel, that's that's the really weird prophet, right? God had him want to do a lot of really weird things, had him lie on his side, his right side for a number of days, and his left side for a number of days, had him build a little model of Jerusalem. This was during the Babylonian captivity and before the end of Jerusalem, build a little city and and throw things at it <laughs> and a, a city of Jerusalem and, and build little siege engines and things and put them around it. And everybody was like, they'd come and see what kind of weird stuff is Ezekiel doing today? It's that prophet. He's also the dry bones prophet, but he is the prophet who in Ezekiel 34, and I'm going to encourage you because we it's beyond our time frame here to do this, but I'm going to tell you to pause and go read Ezekiel 34. And what's the heading there? We'll, we'll use the heading now. Irresponsible shepherds. The Lord, through Ezekiel, is lambasting the spiritual leaders and the civil leaders, because remember, Jerusalem, there were both. There were the priests and there were the kings, the princes, the ones who were in civil authority, all under God. And they were a disaster. They were awful. And he says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds? Feed the flocks, and it just goes on the whole chapter. And it's a it's not a terribly long chapter, but it's a long chapter. But go read it. And and if you do that, you'll get much more out of what we're going to see here in John 10. When he's talking to the Jews who most recently were on him just 10 minutes ago. They were arguing with him because he'd healed a blind man, and then he told them that they were blind. They who are the leaders, they were blind. They weren't happy about that. Without pause, he goes right on to say, Note, notice there's nothing here that would indicate in the text that this is a different conversation. He just goes right on. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. 
to him the doorkeeper opens and the shepherd and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out and when he brings out his own sheep he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice yet they will by no means follow a stranger but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers jesus used this illustration but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them as i read through this i think for the the hundredth time that i am thankful that as a a young man in high school and college growing up in the middle of america in the middle of indiana that i worked on a big hog production facility and then toward the end of the time that i was there and and working with hogs is one thing they're their own they're their own critter They're, (laughs) they're very smart and they're very hard to keep enclosed if there's a way out hogs will find a way out but then toward the end of the time that i was working there he he switched over from having all hogs to also having sheep and and i learned a good bit about what sheep are like and because i was only working there part time at that time the sheep knew the owner of the farm they knew him and when i would come around they would act skittish because they didn't know me they knew him and they trusted him and they didn't know me and they didn't trust me and i also hadn't learned how to move and act around sheep because it's completely different than being around other types of of livestock but sheep are different they get attached the one who takes care of them an emotional attachment jesus says most assuredly and that's truly truly amen amen if you look in the greek we'll go to the greek here and i've had requests from the audience that i make the greek bigger so there i just made it bigger amen amen that's amen amen is what we say but it's barely verily truly truly that's what he's Thing. And, and, and whenever he says that, it's like, this is really important. Get this, get this. And remember, whom is he speaking? He's speaking to the Jews. Now, everyone there was a Jew. But when John talks about the Jews, he's talking about the leadership, the power structure, the Sanhedrin, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, Matthew and Mark and Luke, they'll break them out as groups. John wrote his gospel much later, and he just lumps them all together. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up by some other way, the the same is a thief and a robber. Now, Jesus in this section, and you'll notice I I color-coded things, the door, the door. He says the door in this short nine verses, and that's all we're covering tonight, nine verses. He says it four times. And here in verse seven, he says, I am the door of the sheep. And that is why, and I'll pull the picture back down here because I can do it. This way. That is why it shows Jesus, and that's this art artistic rendering, is Jesus as, as the door. But the sheep were locked up, and, and the only way to get in was through the door. And if you weren't, you had to go over. It had to go over. So if someone was coming in to steal the sheep, if someone was coming in to attack the sheep, uh, a wolf, a lion, a bear, whatever it might be, that is how they would go. But remember, I reminded you that much of the discussion going back for chapters was Jesus' identity. And here he proclaims himself to be the door. That's the only way you get to the sheep is through me. And by calling himself the door, he's basically saying what he says in John 14, verse 6, where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is a more condensed statement of this explanation of being the door he is inside his safety outside 
is danger. And when the sheep go outside, the shepherd goes before them and he leads them. And good way to think about shepherds. Shepherds were the most selfless of people. Their entire existence was about the well-being of the sheep. They would live their entire lives out of doors, intense and the like, but always with the sheep. They genuinely cared for the sheep. They were attached to the sheep. But there are those who come in through a different way. Remember, they didn't want anything to do with Jesus, but they still want the sheep. Why do they want the sheep? Because the sheep are wealth. The sheep are power. The sheep are something that can be controlled. Jesus wasn't about controlling. He says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But those who just want gain. However you want to picture that, and we'll talk about it more, those who just want gain, they don't want to go through Jesus to get there because that takes their power and authority away. So they climb in by some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. And hopefully you have gone and read Ezekiel 34 and and seen that picture, and it is a prophetic picture that talks about the true shepherd who was to come, and he was going to gather all the scattered sheep from the hills that that had ran and scattered in different directions on a stormy, dark day. That's who Jesus is saying he is. Everyone else is a thief and a robber, and that's a pretty Harsh statement, but it'll get more direct than that. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, this is picture language. Jesus doesn't call this a parable, but it is a figure. It is a figure of speech. And in a figure of speech, you can be more than one thing. So Jesus is the door, and that brings the picture of the sheep pen to mind, but he's also the shepherd of the sheep. So the shepherd comes and the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice, hear his voice. And that was the way it worked. Let's say there were eight different shepherds who kept their flocks together in that pen. The one shepherd would come and he would start to call his sheep. He would call out to them and they knew his voice and they would come. And if one of them didn't come or some of them didn't come, he would call them by name, just like you might go out in the backyard and call your dog. And and they would come. But the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. What a tender picture. They're not just sheep. They're not just money on the hoof that eventually is going to be slaughtered and, and whatever else, and a lot of them weren't going to be until they were old because they were about getting the wool from the sheep. But he names them. He cared for them. And that's the picture Jesus gives. How important it is that you know that Jesus cares for you. He doesn't care for you because you're part of the collective of mankind. You know, most of us, In real life, real terms, we make the mistake of thinking that Jesus so loved the world, but he just puts up with me. That's the way we think. And it's not the way he thinks. He knows us. We are special to him because we are his. We are his dear sheep. We are his dear children, whatever picture you want to know, but he want to use, but he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. How do you know his voice? How do you know his voice? Well, the way you know his voice is first of all, spending time in his word and spending time in his word prayerfully. Don't just read the word. When you go back and read Ezekiel 34, because I know some of you haven't done it yet. When you go back and read Ezekiel 34, pray that he will show you what it means. 
to give you insight and an understanding. Pray that he'll help you apply it and know how to apply it in your lives. Pray that he helps you take this beautiful picture of being his dear little lamb and his care for you and applying that to how you look at your daily existence. Because it says here, he brings them out and he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. One picture with that, the shepherd doesn't expect you to go anywhere he doesn't go. He doesn't expect you to go anywhere he hasn't been. And we can look at the future. We can look at this latter day that we seem to be in and have anxiety about what may come. And first of all, we know that our shepherd is with us, but we know what he has done to conquer sin, death, and hell on our behalf. The price that he paid being the good shepherd, this is next week's lesson, but the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep and our our weak arms are strengthened and and our, our trembling knees are calmed and we're okay and we're more than okay. And, and that's how this section that we're in actually ends. He goes before him for them and the sheep follow him or they know his voice. Spend time knowing his voice. Spend more time knowing his voice, learning to hear his voice, to listen for his voice, than you do being entertained, than you do being diverted. Do you think that's any small thing that Satan is so fascinated with keeping us entertained and diverted? Yeah, he doesn't want us listening to the shepherd. He doesn't want us knowing his voice. But the more difficult things become, the more treacherous the path, all the better I want to know my shepherd so that I can follow him, so that I can be confident that he is leading me, and so that I don't have to be afraid. Because being afraid stinks. How much time, be honest with yourself, how much time do you spend being afraid? And it's all wasted energy. It's wasted energy because Jesus, your good shepherd, assures you, the one who goes before you, whose voice you know, assures you you're okay. Why? Because you're with him, and he's not afraid of anything, and he has power over everything. So knowing that, I know I am okay, and and I know that what it says next, I want to apply to me, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee for him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. For those who are older and maybe those who just watch reruns, the old show Magnum P.I., Magnum P.I., Thomas Magnum would talk about that little voice in his head that he knew he shouldn't do that or he knew he shouldn't trust that person. And every time he didn't listen to the little voice, he regretted it. Well, I can't always identify what's wrong with different teachings, preachings, or leadings, things that are trying to to take control out there in the world, but I know when they don't ring true. I know when they don't sound right. And, And the more I know my Lord's word, which is his last will and testament to us, the better I know that, the more I have allowed it to permeate my being, to reshape my soul, then the more quickly it is, the more ready I am that I hear those things that just don't ring true. And I go, nope, don't want to have anything to do with that. That's stranger. That, that, that's not the Lord I know. I don't know where that comes from, but I know I shouldn't follow it. That's the thought process. And that's what we want to have Go on. Those teachings that are strange, we don't want to have anything to do with. Jesus used this illustration, but they, the Jews, did not understand the things which he spoke to them. They didn't get it. It didn't get through to them. And, and, you know, and there were believers there, too. Listening, and we'll see that as we progress farther down toward the end of this section in the next week's in the next week's lesson. But 
we have an advantage they didn't have. Now, they were there with Jesus. That is true. But we have the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost and has been that blessing to the church ever since, and they did not. So sometimes we look at it and say, how, how didn't they see this? That's oftentimes why. But he's not done. He's going to go the extra mile and go deeper. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Again, I am the door of the sheep. We've been spending all this time talking about who I am. You keep questioning me. I keep telling you, and you keep rejecting it, but I'm telling you, I am the big guy. I am the door to the sheep. I am the way of salvation. And as we, as we do this shepherd talk here, this is an important dynamic in this. They did know that prophecy from Ezekiel. They knew of the whole Old Testament. It was the backbone of their culture and reality and society. But the really big things like that, they knew very well. And Jesus is saying to those who were his opponents, those who were his mortal enemies, meaning they intended to kill him, and eventually they did because he allowed them, because the good shepherd lays down his life, They don't take it. He lays it down. He's taking that prophecy about lousy, no good, crooked, corrupt, spiritual and civil leaders, and he's saying, that's you. And while while I have to explain that to you, I have to remind myself of it, they didn't miss that part. They got it. They knew what he was saying. They knew what he was saying about who they were, and they're going to understand what he's claiming to be as the fulfillment of that prophecy in Ezekiel 34, the true shepherd who was promised to come because it's even tied in with David. He is the descendant of David. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, again, Amen, amen. Let's go look and make sure. Verse 7, here we are. Amen, amen, right there. He said it to him again. Truly, truly, he's trying to get through to them. I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. This part right there. He's saying what Ezekiel 34 says applies to you. You're those lousy, no good shepherds who get fat and push the little weak lambs out of the way and trample through the water and leave them mud to drink. Hopefully you've read Ezekiel 34. That's you. That's who you are. You are thieves and robbers. And how are they thieves and robbers? You know, it's, it is easy, and it's, it's all too common for those who preach and proclaim, and, and people who, frankly, I look at, and the, their ability to speak, their eloquence, their presentation is just off the charts. And I look at them and their skills, I envy. But there are those who garner fame and wealth. Always be suspicious of a preacher of the gospel who's worth $45 million. I'm sorry. I'm really suspicious of them. How do you serve the one who said, how do you serve the one who said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head and garner for yourself, filling up your big barns with $45 million or more. Be suspicious of them, but you can have all those skills, you can have all those abilities, and you can even preach and proclaim the gospel with power and authority and might and be doing it for the wrong reasons. Because by so doing, you build a following, you build a cult of personality, you build an empire, personal wealth, and power. And that is far too common in this world. They are thieves 
and robbers. And the one they thieve and rob from most is the Lord God, because the glory belongs to him. At the end of the day, no matter who we are, I with my humble efforts here, you with your humble efforts in your life, at the end of the day, we say we are undeserving servants. We have done our duty. And we're glad that the Lord God gets all the glory. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. That was the shepherd's job. Take them to pasture. Take them to the things that fed them. Take them to the water that they needed. Take care of them first. And if in the process you get sore-footed from all the walking and you're thirsty and you're hungry and you're tired, that's okay. Because the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's That's the shepherd's role. Take care of the sheep. And if the bear comes, if the lion, if the wolf comes, you put yourself between that threat and the sheep, just as Jesus' ancestor David had done. The thief does not come. And in this passage is often applied rightly to Satan, who is the ultimate thief. And all of those who serve in the church who serve in Israel in that day and are serving for their own glory, for their own sake, to build their own kingdom and empire, they are serving the dark Lord. They've taken the Faustian bargain. When, when, G, when Satan said to Jesus, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment's time and said, all these I give you if you bow down and worship me. They bow down and worship him, and so they get these things because he is the prince of this world. He is. For the time being, he is. And those who serve him, who are thieves, just as him, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. And if you want to understand Satan, it's all right there. Mark this one down. It's easy. The two numbers are the same. John 10.10. The thief does not come except. It's It's the only reason he comes is to steal and to kill, and to destroy. He wants it all, and if he can't have it, he'll kill it and destroy it. He'll slaughter it. He'll leave it waste because he's pure hate, and it's all about him and his insatiable greed and desire for more and more and more. That's who the enemy is, and those who serve, who are within the church and without, that's what they are about they do not come except to steal to kill and destroy in complete contradistinction to that absolute diametrically opposed i have come the one who he's getting ready to call in the next verse see verse 11 i am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep i have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly, that they may have it to the full. That's what Jesus wants for us. That's what Jesus wants for us. And when we follow him, that's what we have. We realize the blessings that we have. We're thankful for the day. We're we're thankful to know that we are his. We're thankful to know that we have opportunity in whatever ways to serve him. It is only in him following after our shepherd who leads us with his voice, that we have true peace, that we have true satisfaction, that we have true meaning and purpose. Look at the world. Everyone is lacking. All those who aren't following Christ lack meaning and purpose, and they build big barns, and they have toys and wealth, and they chase after all of that, and they are empty and sad. And we have the blessing of sharing with them this message of salvation about the Savior who loves us, who died for us, who leads us, who cares for us, who promises to watch over us, and that we may have life and have it more abundantly. And here's the, the question I'll leave you with to think about and to, and to prayerfully consider. What do you think 
imagine Jesus looking right at you, because he does, looking right at you and saying this, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. What is that abundance? What defines it? What does it give? And what is it not? Spend time thinking about that. These are things that we need to meditate upon and prayerfully consider as as we drive here and there, as, as we do our work, as we live with our family and interact with our friends. What is life, abundant life? What is that? And I'll assure you this, the more time you spend in his word, the more time you learn honing your skill at hearing his voice, the more you're going to understand, the more we are going to understand what that abundant life that he wants us to have, what that is. This is. Matthias 76. Together, we are decoding the deception. God bless and have a great day.